Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach and teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level, to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. For this episode, I'm going to keep my introduction brief, as today's topic is a mammoth that can go in so many directions, keeping you on the edge of your seat. So I want to save the time and also let you engage in our conversation from your own perspective. You may be familiar with the Mandela Effect. Either you have read about it or heard about it, or maybe you have experienced this phenomenon yourself. Or maybe you have no clue what this is all about. In either case, prepare yourself for a treat of this very uncommon conversation as we dive into decoding the Mandela Effect. I'm delighted to welcome my special guest, Cynthia Sue Larson, back to Quantum Living, who doesn't really need introduction, as this is her third appearance on my podcast. If by any chance you have missed our two previous episodes, Quantum Jumps and The Quantum Age, after listening to this conversation, you will absolutely want to catch up on those two, I guarantee. Cynthia is a best-selling author of several books, a researcher, and reality shifters practitioner, helping people learn how to access the quantum world of possibilities to improve their lives. Her most notable books are Reality Shifts, Quantum Jumps, and of course, the most recent book, The Mandela Effect and Its Society, From Me to We, which we'll be talking about today. You will find more information about Cynthia and her work, including links to her online presence and her books, in the show notes on my podcast website at quantumlivingpodcast.com. Hello, Cynthia. Welcome back to Quantum Living. And thank you so much for being here. You are our regular guest by now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'm so happy to be with you, Anna. I love talking with you. You just have this way of cutting to the core of a topic and seeing things that illuminate it for everybody involved. So I thank you for your crystal perception. <laughs> thank you so much. And likewise, I, I love having you on my show because you are a, a well of wisdom, knowledge and experience which I'm sure my listeners will benefit from. First of all, congratulations, and that's a big congratulations, on your latest book, The Mandela Effect and Its Society, From Me to We. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I have read it, and I already know that I will read it again at least twice, if not more. What an extraordinary reference and a book of knowledge on the Mandela Effect. Wow, superbly researched and written. I'd like to dive right into it. So at this point, I'll ask you if you could please explain uh, briefly what is the Mandela effect, and obviously we will get into all the nitty-gritty of it, and the intriguing title and subtitle, which I guess will be a kind of an overview of the key message of this book, as the title usually is, to set the scene for our conversation. Yes, thank you. Yeah, the the meaning of Mandela effect, the term itself, um, people look it up on the internet and it's frequently called, it's described and defined very differently than the way I would describe or define it. So I'm going to start with what's it's currently, I'd, I'd say mistakenly <laughs> described as, and that word has the word mistake in it. Um, so when pe when you look it up online, you'll see it's supposedly all about misremembered or mistaken memories or collective misremembered memories, that kind of thing. 
which is um, pretty much jumping to an assumption about what's happening right from the get-go, assuming that people are just confused or worse, perhaps confabulating and just, you know, leading each other astray. (laughs) I'm sorry. It's very funny to me. Anyway, I would definitely not describe it as that or define it as that, but rather I would say you notice a Mandela effect when you and perhaps a few others remember something differently than the the official history describes. And so it means that you, you encounter that situation where you totally know for sure that you remember something correctly. And better yet, you've got other people also sometimes remembering it along with you. Sometimes there aren't the other people, but the Mandela effect came into prominence because there were large groups of people remembering very specific things very differently than anything that the historical evidence would support. So that's the definition. And then the title of the book, you're right, it is unusual, and there's layers of meaning in the subtitle itself. Um, So the title is The Mandela Effect and Its Society, because without the people, there would be no Mandela Effect. We are the core of it. And then the subtitle is talking about awakening from me, which is a bit of a play on words because the Mandela effect is often known as M, capital M, yes. capital E. <laughs> <laughs> so it's awakening from that me to we. And then that would be um, growing up as a collective evolution of consciousness, which is one of the theories about what might be happening with the Mandela effect. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. And, you know, I bet you that Nelson Mandela has never imagined that his legacy will include bringing to light a mysterious phenomenon of jumping to different timelines of alternate collective memories coined with his name. He must be very happy in spirit. (laughs) Yes, (laughs) I hope so. And he deserves it. You know, he's not the only person who's come back whose people noticed were, were dead and then alive again. And 1987 is the year that many of us remember that he passed away while incarcerated on Robbins Island. And now, of course, he didn't die in jail. He went on to be president of South Africa. But I, um, in my first book, Reality Shifts, I talked about the actor Larry Hagman being alive again. He, You might know Larry Hagman yeah. from I Dream of yeah. Jeannie, the TV show from the 60s. And then also yeah. from Dallas, I think he was J.R. Ewing, and so so I remember he died in the 1980s also, you know, kind of similar to Nelson Mandela, but then he was also alive again, and he's the one that I could have popularized, but that didn't catch on. And I think I'm just as happy that it's <laughs> Nelson Mandela, because I like I like his I- ideas for freedom, for sovereignty. I think you're right, yes. he'd be pleased. With yes, what we're doing. and in fact, even in this uh, recent book, you quote your own case of apparently having died that some people remembered quite clearly, and they said, "Oh my goodness, no thank goodness that you are still alive." <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, which is interesting <laughs> to say the least. Another evidence that this phenomenon is growing, or at least being increasingly noticed, and we will get to all this in a moment. You say in your book that Mandela effect experience is different from typical confusion or doubt, as in that moment people feel a sense of disorientation and surprise. And I can absolutely attest to that. As you know, I've had quite a few Mandela effect experiences, some of which I will share. And I can confirm that in those moments, I was always almost like frozen in time for a few seconds, quite literally stunned like a fish, (laughs) as my brain was frantically searching for the logical explanation of what just happened. And I think that disorientation is a good word here. I'd like to share a few of my recent reality shift experiences just briefly. Last month, I had an ultrasound. And when the results were ready, I was given access to the actual images while the report was sent to my doctor. So I logged in to the portal and as I reviewed those images, I saw there was one particular image that caught my attention because there was just something I wanted to discuss with my doctor. So I just noted it down. I should have taken a screenshot, which I now regret that I didn't. Anyway, 
couple of days later, I logged in again because I was going to see my doctor to have another look at this image, and it wasn't there. It was gone. I went through the whole film, you know, back and forth several times. I called the radiology and I said, look, someone has replaced my test results. No, that's absolutely impossible. Anyway, the radiology completely denied that they have touched or did anything with my ultrasound images. And when I then saw my doctor and she was looking from her end, and again, we were looking together on her computer, that image was not there. She had this funny look, <laughs> like, what is she smoking? <laughs> because I was adamant I saw that image and I described it to her in great detail and there were some data that image was gone. Another case study. After COVID, so that's end of COVID, after COVID, so that's what, two, two and a half years ago, one of my local health food stores shut down, or so I thought, or so I was told. And one day when I tried to call them just to check if they have something that I was looking for, no one was picking up the phone. So I called their sister store and they said, oh, yeah, no, very sorry. They, they've actually closed down because business wasn't really going well. So they've decided to shut the store down. I said, are they going to reopen? Oh, we don't know, but uh, because we helped them with all the final stock take, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't think so, that they will reopen. Fast forward to but. A month ago, I was looking for something else in the health food store. And for some reason, I, I called the same, I called them that store that I knew was closed. And lo and behold, someone answered the phone. They confirmed, yes, you know, we've got this item. So I went there. There was a gentleman there I've never seen before. So I bought a few items. And then I said, you know, I'm really so glad that you have reopened after COVID, after you've closed down. He looked at me and said, We've never shut down. <laughs> we have booming business during COVID and after. We never shut down. I said, well, your sister store told me, well, I don't know who told you, but we never shut down. Now, the third case study is mind-blowing. It happened only a couple of weeks ago. I decided to look online for a garlic press. And I actually saw a new style, different style, which I've never seen before, which is like rocking. So it's all sol made of solid steel or metal, and it's rocking, type of rocking garlic press. You put a garlic on the cutting board, and then you press it, and you rock, and it beautifully minces garlic. So I called my local Matchbox store, asked if they have it. Yes, we do. I went there, and she said, this is the last one. So I said, could you please put it aside for me? Yes, that's fine. I got to the store, I opened, it was like in a little cardboard box, I opened the box, the press was in a small cellophane bag, which was open, I put my hand in to grab the handle, and it was perfect, so I said, that's fine, I put it back in, closed the box, and, and I said, I'll just take a few minutes to browse through your store, because I haven't been here for a long time. After about five minutes, and during the time I saw there was one other customer came into the store, after about five minutes, I finished browsing. I came back and said, okay, so that's fine. I, I just take this. I paid. I went home. I get home and I open the little cardboard box. I open the cello bag, take out the press, the garlic press. It was completely wet with water. <laughs> now, the outside of the cello bag was dry. The cardboard box was dry, so it wasn't like some water from my shopping bag got into it. And it wasn't just wet. It had so much water on it, it looked as if you put it under the tap to rinse it off, and you didn't even shake the water off and just put it into that. There was so much water there. And I said, where did it come from? I mean, so I called the store. <laughs> And I said to the lady, why my garlic press is wet? While I was browsing in your store, did you open it? Did you <laughs> remove it? Did you wash it? Did you replace it? She said, no. God, no. <laughs> and she probably thought as well, what is she smoking? Because I said, it is absolutely wet, full of water. And only inside, there is not a droplet of water on, on, the, on the outside of the bag or on the cardboard box that it was in. 
She said, look, if you're not happy with it, please bring it back. I'll give you the refund. So no, 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 I'll keep it because this is just what I was looking for. But I can put this incident, this experience, absolutely in the, in the category of 100% evidence. There is no way that this amount of water could have, I could see like droplets all over it. It was wet in the category of miracle, in the category of sudden reality shift for whatever reason, but I saw it. I knew what I saw and I felt it and it is absolutely unexplainable. And in those and many other similar experiences, I made a couple of interesting observations that I would love to hear your take on. Firstly, I often feel in those moments that the energy around me suddenly feels differently. And it's hard to explain, but it has different quality to it for a few seconds. And secondly, and this is, this is really curious, I notice that every time there is always a slim margin of possibility of a rational explanation even as a remote likelihood with astronomical odds. In other words, there is never a concrete proof or evidence no one can refute, apart from this Gallic press incident, which is absolutely 100% proof. But otherwise, I found there is always a slim margin left of doubt. Well, there is some likelihood of a rational explanation. And I wonder why, what is the universe telling us? Oh, it's a huge question. It's it's asking us to pay attention. It's, I, I think when the garlic press or the shop have suddenly being opened that you know for sure had been closed, uh, these kinds of things, but the garlic press especially for you, when something like that happens and there is no other explanation, that's, that's the invitation. Um, the universe, the cosmos appears to be asking, are you ready to look at this? Are you ready to look deeper? What does this mean to you? When what seems to be true, what you seem to believe in that's always been a certain way, this is, has never been that way. Like the whole village that I mentioned in my book in England that was missing a dinosaur, they, they f were certain of it. They polled the, the citizenry to find out how many people are upset that our museum has been hiding the dinosaur all these years. And half of the population of the village was very upset. This is Bolton in England. And that's amazing when you've got half the people, including on the city council, these are prominent, these are not just nutcases in the community. It's not the, <laughs> the ones that are a little bit, you know, they're not so bright. It's not those, no. These are the movers and shakers that remember for sure there was a dinosaur at the front of the Natural History Museum. So it's inviting everyone collectively to take a look at what we thought was true. Really pay attention to this and take it seriously because you know, this, it holds great promise for us. And I love the way you mentioned the energy that you feel, because that's the kind of wave that I've been able to successfully uh, manage when aware that there are a couple of outcomes. Um, I recently, I, I want to give it a short story. Um, okay, this is a short one. But this is how to utilize that energy wave when you feel that it's there. Because good things can happen when you're asking how good can it get. So I was teaching a workshop with Paula Harris in Crestone, Colorado. And she had um, she'd done a good job of locking up our apartment. We were sharing an apartment together. And it was the day that we were supposed to check out. Now, I should explain. Crestone is highly remote. It's 7,500 feet high, something like that, in the middle of nowhere. And so it was a holiday, Memorial Day weekend. So in case we did lock ourselves out, it would take at least four to five hours for someone to drive the distance from the town to where we were. That's a four to five hour drive one way. And then there'd be, then, you know, they're going to charge for that. Anyway, so here's the story. It was the last day. We were just returning to pick up my, apparently it was just my suitcase that was still in the apartment. I needed to go in to get it. And strangely, the com combination code did not work to open the front door. And Paula looked sort of like stunned, like, oh no, this is not good. And I said, what about the back door? She said, I locked the back door. But that's when I felt this wave of energy. And that's when I felt, 
And I told her, oh, this is wonderful. This is really good. Don't worry about it. Because <laughs> I'll tell you why, because I'm really good at go. if I need to be inside my track record of getting inside any door or building, no matter how locked it seems to be. It's not a, it's not a, this is like, this is my thing. Like, like, hang on, I'm just going to run around back. I was delighted. So, you know, I'm in the state of joy, high energy, feeling the wave. It's kind of like, we got this, but of course in prayer the whole time, because I don't know yet, will it really be? I, I believe her that she locked it. She was really good at locking that back door. And so I'm, I'm believing her and I, and I approach the back door. I can now see it. It's locked. It's a sliding glass door. It's in the locked position, but I've, I, it, I still don't give up. I'm like, no problem. And so I see if I can slide it. And sure enough, I could slide it open. So this is an example of playing with the idea that I talk about in this book about being in a superposition of states. And I like the way you're bringing up the energy because this is how to make use of it when you know you can go into a place of joy. And I share some of my own personal experiences where things are quite extraordinary, quite good. Because um, we can we can harness that. We can ride that wave and choose if you've got two choices where it could be the back door is actually locked, locked, fully locked. Or, or maybe it looks like it's locked, but somehow you can still open it anyway. <laughs> could you briefly explain the concept of superposition? Yes. This is a quantum concept and that they have a lot of quantum terms described and defined in the book. So, and, but the, the idea is so important because it shows that sometimes there can be a state of like for a door, it can be locked or it can be unlocked, or in this case, maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so if something is one way or another in quantum physics, um, we would say, for example, a, a quantum so-called particle could either show up and be measured as a particle, or we might be able to observe that it seems to be operating in a wave state. So it's not acting at all like a particle, it's showing its waviness. And because we don't really know, you know, which it is until we take the measurement, it's a little bit of a mystery. And this is where the idea of Schrodinger's cat comes from, the cat in the box. And is the cat alive or is the cat dead? Because this was physicist Irving Schrodinger's a way of showing that basically um, something as ridiculous as saying, you know, the, it's one thing to say a quantum particle is in a superposition of states. You know, is it a particle or is it a wave? In other words, is it still wave functioning around through the cosmos? Or has it chosen to collapse and show itself and choose a certain way of man physically manifesting in our reality? So that's what... The, the quantum part is now if you bring it to a, the the size of something that we love like a cat inside of a box this is where it starts to get ridiculous and that's why Irvin schrodinger presented the experiment that if you have a cat in the box that's breathing the air that's supposedly clean air and it's got enough air to breathe but there's a little jar of poison gas that somebody has put in there and this is a hypothetical cat no cats were actually harmed okay <laughs> <laughs> So, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, and then the trigger mechanism to break the glass, it's triggered by a, a random number generator, which is basically the a, the decay from a, you know, a radioactive nuclear particle, which is a quantum particle. So it starts with this quantum randomness and then it's linked to a cat. So the big the big reveal then is Schrodinger says until someone opens the box you're, you're asking us to believe that this cat is both alive and dead inside of the box. And yes, that's exactly what quantum physics is saying. So Nelson Mandela can be both alive and dead in 1987. Some of us know he died, but, but then he's alive again. And I went through my own alive again experience. You had some very strange superposition of state experiences with your shop that apparently shut down in one reality. However, in another, it never closed. And then even weirder with the garlic press, you know, one where it was just the way that you put it in the box when you continue to shop. Another where who knows what happened? <laughs> like, how did it get so wet? Yeah, I mean, there's no explanation. Thank you. On the previous episode, we talked about your book, Quantum Jumps. And the question that I had in my mind when I was reading this book, or one of the questions, because I have many, <laughs> is... What is the relationship of a collective reality shift to individual quantum jumps? And maybe you could link it somehow also to an out-of-body experience. And 
even soul journeys to other dimensions. So what's the relationship between a collective reality shift versus individual quantum jumps or a spiritual experience? Yeah, individual quantum jumps and, and experiences are, um, I use the term quantum jump to indicate something intentional. So feeling that energy, riding that wave, knowing, oh, this is something I've done before, let's do it. Whether it's the broken dishwasher or the locked back door, whatever, just knowing like, this is great. I know how to surf these waves and just hold fast to how good can it get. I'm visualizing the desired outcome, connecting with that that oneness sense of love and divine wisdom, that unity consciousness. Uh, for a group, um, Mandela effect is hardly ever quite so um, just, you know, selective, at least at this juncture. I think we're starting to see a change because there are intentional groups working with energy for healing, for example. So there will be um, the groups of eight that, that we hear about with, um, you know, I think author Lynn McTaggart has set those up. The, and so those those groups, they're very intentional and they're working with symbols like Reiki and they're working collectively in much the way that prayer groups have functioned for thousands of years in the past. So whether it's a prayer group or these newer forms of getting people together collectively, um, that would be very similar to quantum jumping, very intentional. The Mandela effect currently is known more the way I would use the term reality shift, where it's where you, you, you're trying to find some lost object in your house, nobody's visited, but suddenly something that you know where it should be, it's not there. And when you finally, <laughs> hopefully you do find it, and when you do find it, it was probably in some very strange place that you know you did not put it there. And that's where people say, I've got elves or ghosts or something. But when you experience these things collectively, it takes on a new feeling. And the collective would be, remembering movies and products differently. Um, so people remember the Snow White movie, Mirror, Mirror on the Wall, who's the fairest of them all, except mm -hmm. apparently, um, it, it, um, yeah, it's never been that. That sounds right to me, so I say it that way. But now apparently it's only ever been Magic Mirror on the Wall, who's the fairest of them all. And even Walt Disney himself which was an amazing thing for me to notice when I was writing this new book. Um, he, he, right after that movie came out, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, he was saying mirror, mirror on the wall. And he was a stickler for detail. So very interesting. It was interesting to find that old clip showing what we would call reality residue. But getting back to your question, it, it appears that when there are groups of people and they're collectively in sort of a reality bubble or a Vigner bubble, and that's what's pictured on the cover of the book, you know, the the two hand holding these two um, kind of reality bubbles or Vigner bubbles. These bubbles of reality are groupings of consciousness. So you might have people that remember it one way. And some people would say, I don't know what you're talking about. It's only ever been magic mirror on the wall. That's not even a big deal. What are you guys going on about? But then they say, okay, we've got another one for you. What about the Berenstein Bears? <laughs> Or, you know, they'll try to find something like some, surely one of these uh, Mandela effects that will register. Mm. Would you agree with my earlier point that usually there seems to be a margin of doubt left that there might be or could be a logical explanation somehow? Is this your experience as well or not really? For the most part, but then I'll get a. I've had a couple of doozies, and I just got a doozy a couple of days ago for myself. I, I I get them when I I think when I need them. So it seems like then there's one that's personal for me, um, having to do with a TV show that was started in Berkeley where mm -hmm. I live. And back in, I remember watching it. It was called Thinking Aloud with Jeffrey Mishlove, and um, I was watching a recent interview because he was interviewing me, and then I wanted to see, well, what's he been up to? And I saw one of his interviews. And the strangest thing was something he said. He said, when I started the show in 1987, and I know that can't be right for me because there's no way I could have been watching it in 1987. I was watching it five or six years before that. Before it existed, I was watching it because that's when I had time to watch TV because I was a student at UC Berkeley studying physics. And that was my favorite TV show, all about consciousness. He would interview Fred Allen Wolf and people who would talk about consciousness, and I loved it. I, I would have majored in consciousness if they had that major at Berkeley. 
but um, but now that's impossible because that show did not exist when I know for sure, absolute sure I was watching it. And because I was in the apartment, I remember where I was watching it, when I was watching it. And I had no time to watch it. Um, you know, five years later in 1987, I was then married, working at Citibank. I was a project manager. I, at that point, I'd finished my MBA degree. There was no time to watch any TV, not certainly not daytime TV on a PBS public broadcasting station. So it was, for me, mind-blowing. And there's no explanation. So what did Jeffrey say? I haven't mentioned it to him because it happened after I had the interview with him. I'll be sure to put it in a com when it comes, it'll be coming up in a week or so. And I'll, I'll definitely put that comment in there. Like this is mind blowing. <laughs> I, I bet you for him, he'll say, well, of course I started it in 1987. I've checked everything. I went to IMDB, which is the powerhouse. Yeah. It's the, mm -hmm. the archive. It's like the, the encyclopedia yeah. Britannica of everything that's ever been published for TV or movies. It says 1987. There's nothing about, uh -huh. well, you know, they started the early version back in 1981 and 82 when Cynthia watched it. No, nothing like that. <laughs> wow. And speaking of disappearing objects, I've got another very curious experience just a few months ago. I was looking for a couple of books by Michael Newton, Journey of Souls and Destiny of Souls, which I bought online a few years prior, and I couldn't find them. I went through my whole library and they are gone. They are not there. Now, I wouldn't have lent them to anyone. I wouldn't have thrown them out. They are not there. And so that was completely puzzling. But more so, I then talked to a friend about it. And I said, look, I mean, I don't know what's going on. Where are those books? And she said, you know, I, I also have happened to have those two books. So I will find them. And if there is anything, because I was looking for some quote, uh, I can, you know, I can give it to you, whatever. And then the next day she emails me. She says, Anna, you wouldn't believe it. I can't find those books. Wow. I know I had them because I bought them and I've gone through my whole library. I cannot find those two books. So now I'll figure that one out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting when it happened to both of you. I like to look into it and in my book, um, this new book I just wrote, I like to talk about reading it like a dream, like what you were doing earlier. Like, what would this mean? like the meaning of water, for example. But in this case, both of you missing the same books by Michael Newton about, these would be groups of people who he was hypnotizing and finding out that they remember lives between lives. Yes, a oh, beautiful book. So now I have to buy them again. <laughs> but that that was, yeah, that was amazing that not only I have lost them, well, they disappeared from my library, but also uh, from my friend's library. The same precise books. And she said, look, I never lose any book. You know, I, it's just impossible. But she said, they are gone. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, I've got another curious question. When we shift to another reality, in that moment, we often change our past. So when we talk about changing our past, from the quantum perspective, isn't this how this can be done. For example, when an old family photo we know so well suddenly looks different, a person is missing or there is something different on the photo, and it was taken 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, this means, I think, that our past has changed. So we have shifted onto, at some point, onto completely another timeline. And if if we could examine our past on this new timeline with this, you know, new family member or, or surroundings looking differently. Effectively, our past has changed. It would have been different at this point. What do you think? Oh, yes, that's true. <laughs> and, and it seems like it's not just on the personal level, like what you're mentioning, like a family photo, but 
we're seeing things changing historically for the United States of America and for the world. Some of the historical things, um, like I've got examples in the book about TV shows around the world and historical things that have happened around the world. And some of these events are different, like um, Black Tom Island. You know, there was a huge explosion that happened in America that was certainly not a historical um, keynote point that was of any prominence in my past, but now it certainly is something that happened where there'd been an attack, I think in World War II on US mainland soil. I sure don't remember that. That would have been a big deal, um, but there it is. Wow. So yeah, there, there are lots of these sorts of changes happening to on the Mandela effect collective level. This would be the collective, the we part of it. The me, the me would be the individual experience and then we is definitely a shared experience. Mm. So at the practical level, and, you know, we, we talk about changing our past, meaning reframing our past, say, in our coaching work with people, and there are ways to do this. But from this perspective, isn't shifting your reality onto a different track, as it were, a valid tool for actually changing your past? It, it is ab absolutely. I, I think every time we make it, we, we feel that wave of energy and we're making a very conscious choice like this one or that one, which timeline are we choosing? We're absolutely changing the past. I think it's uh, unavoidable, really. And, and then consequently, if we have a conversation with childhood friends or school buddies from years gone by, Obviously, there will be times that will they're going to mention something. Remember that funny time when you did such and such, and you have absolutely no memory of anything they're talking about. Like what? what I did what? <laughs> you can ask them like yeah. I do, and they'll say, "Don't you remember that was like the highlight of the year? Like that really happened." And you believe them because they seem so sincere, and you know them. They wouldn't lie about this. But there we are. We've got two completely different realities that occur. Yes, yes. Now I've got a quantum question. If reality shifts is about accessing different memories, okay, let's consider this. Memories are non-local, which is one of the quantum principles, which means that they are not in our brain. They are not contained in our brain, as quantum science tells us. And we access our memories, just like all information, from the quantum field, which is the collective consciousness. So when a large number of people suddenly access a different memory about a particular event in that collective consciousness, what does it mean? Well, it means a lot more than I can probably perceive, but I can try. <laughs> Because that's like, we can look at the tip of this iceberg, but then what the totality of what it means, I can't really say for sure. But we can certainly um, recognize that if a whole bunch of people are collectively doing that, and they're hopefully for good purposes, visualizing something positive, I do recommend um, work with higher levels of conscious agency whenever doing any of these activities, because uh, obviously that'll keep us on on our way to being more loving, more kind, more um, suitable to all of the highest ideals that we most care about and cherish. If we're more like that, then that's good. So working with higher levels of self, higher levels of conscious agency um, as a guide will definitely help to ensure positive results that we're happy with. And then what does it mean when all these people are getting together, visualizing something it means there's a high likelihood, I would say, that they're going to witness that, whether it's for bad or good, I don't know. Hopefully, they're they're asking how good can it get. They're throwing that favorite ingredient into the recipe. <laughs> so in alignment with their higher selves, uh, because then no matter, even if it is something that seems on the face of it, like, well, this is upsetting or this seems inferior, at least there will be that, that's kind of a nudge to take another look like what are we really doing here so i'd pay more attention then to the whole project um, but i would expect success in the sense that at least a large percentage of these people would experience at some point that the their dream their prayer has come true i want a good example is the indigenous people in north american continent both canada and the united states of america 
had been um, praying for the return of the buffalo. And that's, that is happening. And I think the prayers do make a difference. That's that vision, that shared vision, buffalo will return. Yeah, absolutely. How can the Mandela effect be better understood in the context of the quantum physics key principles of consciousness, non-locality, the observer effect, quantum entanglement, etc. And you talk about it in your book. Could you just give us a maybe brief overview of how those principles can explain and maybe even validate the Mandela effect experience? Yeah, certainly. Uh, well, it's a big topic, and that's why I think it's best to explain it in a book. But I'll I can go through a couple Just of briefly, them. Yeah. We t- I'll, I'll, let, <laughs> yeah, we can start with the one we brought up already about the superposition of states, because that's a beautiful way to look at something that um, Mandela effect experiencers often notice in the form of, for example, a flip flop, where they'll notice. Um, things one way. And a a big one here in the United States is something called Chick-fil-A. Costco is another one. These are names of, uh, one one is a chicken fast food restaurant and the other is a a large warehouse store. And their names have flip-flopped, gone back and forth and back and forth. I've seen Costco go from Costco to, in in a period of my time when life, when I was so busy, I didn't have any time to deal with the fact that the, the name changed. All it, I just felt like, oh no, like that's, an, that's a mess up. I don't like the Costco without the T. But that's a superposition of states. I'm really recognizing, is it a particle? Is it a wave? You know, And you'll, you're seeing it kind of going back and forth like that. So quantum physics can share with us the idea, both of the superposition of states, and there's the idea of Hugh Everett III's uh, many worlds interpretation of quantum physics itself. And if you look at the many worlds possibility, boy, does that remind me a lot of the Mandela effect because you can see like in one timeline or one reality, you know, you've got your Costco and then at the other it's Costco. And then there, I think Chick-fil-A has several iterations, three or four of them. And some people see them all. They're like, and it's just like, wow. It's just like when your garlic press is come, arrives wet, it's like, I can't believe it. I'm at Chick-fil-A and the spelling changed again. And now it's this one. It's got four choices or whatever. It's crazy. So, but that's totally possible when you've got this many worlds of, you know, and and the idea with the many worlds interpretation is that the many worlds of quantum physics is one and, and the same as the multiverse. And there are physicists, not just me, but there are some top, really high ranking High rated, wonderful physicists who would say that is the case. And they've written papers about it. And so that those two ideas are very big. Um, there are lots of other ideas within quantum physics. It's just like this amazing toolbox with all these different things. We've got, I don't want to have everyone's head spinning. I think starting with just a couple is a good idea. Mm, yes. And there is still so little that we understand about all this, how how all this works. And uh, yeah, very, very interesting. In your research and your work uh, in this field over many years, you have collected, obviously, a large amount of data, people experiences, and, and there were some studies done and research. So we even have some quantitative data. But more so from the qualitative perspective, What do you think or have you discovered is the impact on people, maybe psychological impact on people who have experienced Mandela effect and maybe continue to experience it in various forms, psychologically or emotionally? Is there some common denominator for those types of people? Could you speak to this for a moment? Yes, I did do uh, surveys on this topic, a couple of them, just checking in to see how people are, what they're normally feeling after they've experienced one of these. And I've got an illustration inside of Quantum Jumps with a cartoon showing the percentages of, you know, what people are feeling. And I I was, I didn't know what to expect. Would people be shocked? I, I thought they might be terrified, but I was pleasantly surprised that most people just took it pretty much, um, in stride, they felt like, okay, this is startling, it's surprising, it's funny, 
caught my attention. Uh, uh, there's a small percentage of people that are scared by it, but that's a very small, really like just a few percent. And that's good because I don't think this should be a scary phenomenon. I'm glad it's not scary for most people. I'm glad it's playful. Uh, when I look at the emotional responses, it's, it's things like surprise, um, astonished, um, occasionally angry, <laughs> Because 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 sometimes <laughs> it's like what happened here, you know. Some things you're, you're yeah. expecting it to be frustrated. Yeah, like like I can see people being angry, opening the garlic press, and then like, why is it wet? Who got this wet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so all these things can happen. You're right. I was actually quite frustrated because I thought, you know, which was a really ridiculous thought that someone, while I was browsing in a store, someone for whatever reason, replaced it with the used one and they didn't, you know, shake off the water that there is. A, I mean, that this is just most ridiculous <laughs> thoughts. <that's coming. laughs> oh. Absolutely. Mm. So it feels like an invitation for hum humanity, for each of us to start just rolling with whatever starting to happen and noticing big changes can happen to our memories, to, to our physical world. It, it seems like the big takeaway is that this physical world that we tend to anchor our science in, the way it's been running for the last 400 years in the Western world, no longer um, the quantum paradigm is actually taking prominence now. So we really are in that quantum age I spoke of in, with you in the previous show. We're here, and it, it's inviting us to really play with it, to to be aware and document what we're noticing not to just ignore it, um, but really honor it. I think that's why some of these are so shocking, so that we can't ignore it. We, our mind just keeps going back to what happened with the garlic press. <laughs> or, or what, yeah. How did that store, how is it open now when it wasn't before? You know, these things can just, they can just lock your attention totally on target and make you look to see what is happening. And when we do this together, we can share our experiences, which I think is where the whole point of the phenomenon is taking us to start recognizing consciousness is running the show. It's not matter. It's not our DNA and the molecules in the body. Yes. It's the consciousness yeah. itself that's premier. It's, it's fundamental. Yes, absolutely. And again, looking at the data uh, that you have collected in your book, it looks like people who are highly sensitive and also people who have psychic skills or their sixth sense highly developed, which means they are basically much more sensitive to energy, more frequently have such experiences. Could you speak to this for a moment? Yes, I have conducted some studies um, with uh, surveys to find out who is experiencing the Mandela effect and also to get them to self-report what their Myers-Briggs um, type is. It's a personality test that was invented by a mother-daughter team. And what the results showed is that the majority of the Mandela effects are being experienced by a minority of our population, as shown, as illustrated by the Myers-Briggs uh, inventory. And specifically, it's the intuitive feelers that I'm talking about, the, sometimes known as empaths. And this is where I, I, my attention is now going to, what is that telling us? And it's showing, I think it's very clear what it's telling us. It's showing us that people who are capable of um, being aware of at least a couple of levels of their own conscious agency. In other words, like their high self and their ego, egoic mortal self. If you can hold those two ideas and you feel like both are yourself, there's a high likelihood you'll be experiencing this sort of phenomenon. And it makes sense that you would because it's it's like there's an interplay going on. And um, it, it, one of the first philosophers who brought this whole subject up, I do want to credit him and I mention him in the book, it's um, Leibniz. He was a mathematician. He was one of the inventors of calculus alongside Isaac Newton, right around that same time period, hundreds of years ago. And he also 
gifted humanity with the pillars of science as we know them now, um, because he was showing us how to look for elegance in our th theories, elegance in the ideas. And so when we do that, we tend to simplify and look at something that's actually working. And Leibniz talked about these levels of perception. He was very clear about it. And of course he would be, because he's one of the inventors of calculus, which is doing something very similar to that. But he would look directly at consciousness itself. And so to me, that's the most exciting part of this. And if I do start writing a new book, it's going to be about this. It's going to be going into this whole thing with the empaths and these levels of conscious agency. And how does that operate? What are we really doing? What can we learn about that? And there's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, I, I, I'm really excited to see that, that I'm not the only one that feels that way. And that some people going back to see like 400 years later after life needs, um, life, some people still agree with me, life needs is the best place to start looking at what is this conscious agency that we'll need when we're designing artificial intelligence? And oh, so forth. yeah. Mm. So now the big question is, given this, can we invite more Mandela effect type of experiences into our life or reality shifts into our life by developing our intuition? Yes, that would help. Intuition is definitely a big factor. Would yeah, you make absolutely. sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In intuition um, and feeling, or um, but intuition itself, I think, is the stronger part of the NF um, empath. Um, <laughs> empathy itself can also be developed in people. Empathy is the combination of feeling with the intuition. Yes, because then I think what would happen is the universe will say, "Okay, now you are more open." and you are sensing energy. So we'll give you more of those experiences to further enhance your understanding and puzzle you and completely dis <laughs> disorient you. But it feels like the universe responds to our level, our personal and collective, obviously, level of development and understanding by giving us experiences that we not only can can understand and accept, but that will stretch us a little bit. So will give us more and perhaps more complex. Like I've had many Mandela effects type experiences in my life, but nothing like that garlic press two weeks ago. I mean, it was in the category of a miracle. It was dry and then it was wet, completely wet. You know, so And the, there was no, absolutely no possibility that that the water somehow got into this, you know, in a physical, physical way. So <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a magic trick, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> watch this. Yes. Yes. And in fact, you drive this thought throughout your book with various exercises to develop our sensitivity and openness yeah. to how energy works, to feel energy and to be, if you're like fluid and flexible yes. in our interaction with energy, with intuition, insights, etc. Because the more we do that, the more of those experiences will be inviting to, to our life. Absolutely. And they can be quite miraculous. I, 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 that's why I've got one chapter, which is just my own personal experiences and starts off maybe seeming a bit random, but then as, as they go through time, it just seems like miracle after miracle keeps occurring, <laughs> like amazing things, like a flat tire of being fixed and just all sorts of things happening that are quite miraculous to me. Yes. And I also had had um, punctured tire. I think I mentioned this on, on our other episode. Yes. And I knew that it was punctured and it was in my, you know, in the boot of my car waiting until I, I can replace it. And then the guy checked and said, there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that happened many years ago. And I think that was one of my first experiences that actually made me stop and think like, hang on a second, <laughs> there is something going on here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah, they, they can be mm -hmm. wonderful. I, I just had money show up in my bank account the other day and I was thinking about getting something that seemed expensive. And then I look and there's just a, an extra amount. Just, out of nowhere. Uh, it came out of nowhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And that re regularly happens. Almost like the universe is saying, it's not so expensive. Go ahead and get the item, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, very funny. You mentioned in your book, The Matrix, the movie, which is one of my all-time favorites, <laughs> when the cat, you know, the famous scene, when the cat walked through the corridor twice, and that was apparently a sign that the program in The Matrix was changed. I'd like to share a similar experience when, uh, that was again several years ago, when I caught The Matrix shifting me, <laughs> to another timeline. I actually caught it by the same sign. So just very briefly, that was, as I said, several years ago, I was uh, having lunch with my friend and we were talking about these topics, this, you know, spirituality, quantum. So that was the whole level of, of our conversation. And we were sitting outside at the table outside the cafe. It was just before the sunset. And my friend went back to the cafe. I think she went to the bathroom and I was sitting facing the street. It was a small street, and then there were some buildings on the other side. I looked up, and I saw a flock of birds took off from the roof. There were, I don't know, maybe 30 of them, so a big flock of birds. Took off the roof, made about 60-degree turn, and then flew over the roof and disappeared behind the building. Within less than a second... I saw the same flock of birds did exactly the same maneuver. <laughs> they flew up, made about 60 degree turn, flew over the roof and disappeared behind the building. Now, it is impossible to have the same flock of birds taking off from behind the building in the same formation within less than a second. So, it was a copycat, if you like, of the cat uh, experience uh, in the Matrix. An event has exactly repeated itself within less than a second. And I felt the energy around me changed. It just changed its quality. I can't even describe it, but it was, I'm even getting chills when I'm speaking about it now. It was a bit cooler and less dense, which lasted for just a few seconds. Anyway, my friend came back. I didn't say anything to her because I knew that, that something happened, but I didn't know whether it was just for me or for both of us. So I didn't say anything. I didn't mention anything. Now, here is an interesting twist. We are going to catch up again. And for some reason, I wasn't able to get hold of her. And a few weeks later, I was speaking with a mutual friend and I asked her, you know, have you seen this person? Because I, I'd like to catch up with her again. And she says, oh, well, um, I don't think you'll be able to, to meet with her again because her mental condition has significantly worsened. She's now on really, you know, psychotropic medications and she's really struggling. And I said, what medical condition? Well, you know, she had this. No. Wow. So, and I, and that was the last time uh, that I saw her. I think I was, I briefly spoke with her on the phone, very, very briefly. And again, you know, she wasn't doing well. And she was talking about that, you know, mental illness that she had. And I said, oh my goodness. She never had any mental illness before when I knew her. So, and this was not something that developed suddenly. As our mutual friend said, you know, she's had this for years. But not in the other reality that you remember. But not, I said, yeah. wow. Wow, indeed. So, and, and then I, uh, obviously, I remember that flock of birds, mm -hmm. which was, you know, the, the matrix experience or the matrix moment. It's kind of like that was the marker. Yes. Like both realities yes. had that. And so you're, you stepped out of one and into another. Yes. And I'm positive that at that point, for whatever reason, the universe shifted me onto a different reality in yes. which my friend had this mental illness and I've never seen her again. And, but that was powerful.
Yeah, thanks to your intuitive skills and sensing energy, then you could really connect with that, um, like the wave function, if you will, from physics, mm-hmm. where the, re- the the particle reality would be the two so-called timelines, where in, in the previous reality, she was didn't have that mental challenge, but in the new reality, she does. Yeah. And the flock of birds was the connector, because it was sort of like an overlay, like yeah. you're m- moving from one timeline to another with awareness that the consciousness is still there. The, con- the consciousness is the the wave function is predominant. You know that that's what really creates all of reality, and that's what we sense with the intuition that you're yeah. observing with the energy. Yes, and what was unusual and unique about this particular experience is that I actually caught the matrix <laughs> shifting the program to use the matrix in the, the movie language. I actually caught the moment, the point in time, you know, in my reality, in in my experience, my awareness, because I think it showed me. Yes. In you know, the the universe knew that I would make the connection with the matrix cat. And the place where I was at at that time was, I don't know, convenient or suitable <laughs> for for the shift to occur. Yes. And it actually showed me and I looked and I saw it and I caught it. I said, that's when it happened at that precise moment in time. Because otherwise we may notice something different, but we we can't really say exactly when, when it happened. It could have been yesterday or a week earlier or a month earlier or whatever. But on, on this occasion, in that instant, I caught it. I knew precisely when it happened, and I felt different. Right. Well, sometimes, sometimes these things, it's most likely to happen, like you observed. I've had this happen twice, and you know, the the glitch in the matrix where something repeats. In one case, a woman passed out her business cards to a group of us, and then she came in and passed out her business cards again. I'm like, oh my gosh. Oh yeah, <laughs> you you mentioned this on on the other episode. Yes. And, and then yeah. a, and then a, in a hotel. Yeah. <laughs> and these these are groups of um, that was like um, these are people studying Reiki and energy together. So yeah. these are the kind of gatherings where these things are more likely to be observed. And then the second time was a consciousness conference, you know, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where a woman entered the hotel twice um, from the parking lot. It, and there, there was no way that could happen within a few seconds. Or you know, she makes the complete passage through the entryway, and then she comes in again, like. What is this, a twin? Did you come through here before? I did question her. She said no. <laughs> it must have sounded weird. Like, but but the yeah. the matrix yes. cat. Yeah. So I think when you get people together talking about consciousness, we'll see some evidence of these kinds of things. And sometimes you'll catch the moment when it happens. That's a very good observation. I love it. Mm, yes, thank you. Now, uh, Cynthia, to wrap it up, what is the meaning? of the Mandela effect and why is it paradigm shifting? Why now? What are we learning from here and where are we going? Could you give us a bit of a summary of the phenomenon? Yeah. Well, just to wrap it up again, it seems like it's showing us this, um, this, this division that we have. We have a mortal physical body and being that we think of as ourselves, but actually we ha- we're much more than that. We've got that wave function spirit consciousness, which would be like the wave function in physics. We have a duality within our, each of ourselves. And it seems clear to me that this phenomenon is inviting us to take a look at that, to recognize that physical reality is not so solid as we assume, and it's not going to stay put. And even the history books can be wrong. Everything is capable of changing, everything, from geography to the physical anatomy, to you name it, it can change. And so when we know that, and we know that we're capable now of talking about this with each other and not being judged crazy, because there's a growing, strong community of those of us who do experience this phenomenon. Well, this is where it gets exciting, and it's given me goosebumps, because then, then we know, collectively, we can actually be asking, how good can it get for the future for all of us? Even if the front door is locked and the back door is locked, we all know it doesn't matter. We can feel the energy that we're all bringing together. We can feel how good can it get. We know that there can be 
a reality that's much better even than what we think is right in front of our face. And I'm mentioning it right now because without going into all the doom and gloom of our times, clearly there are some crises on the horizon and people are pointing at dates and they're quite alarmed about all sorts of things uh, from the climate to the wars to um, nature itself, climate itself, and so on and so forth. I don't need to go through all the details, Every single one of those can be addressed by this powerhouse toolkit that the Mandela effect is bringing us right now at this time. And to me, I I can see it when our bodies are capable of changing, you know, our heart has moved to the middle middle of the chest, kidneys Mm. have moved upward to safety. Yes, I've noticed that. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I also noticed, and this is beyond doubt as as, as far as I'm concerned, that the sun is much brighter, much more like pale yellow than decades ago when I remembered it was very yellow, very different. And you say this in your book, that this apparently a lot lot of people people. have noticed. And some people, you know, there's always that room for doubt and, um, you know, plausible deniability, as you were saying earlier, which is true. (laughs) There's there's always that element of like, well, maybe this is something else. Um, But But if we keep focusing on how good can it get, regardless what people might say that's causing these things, they might have all sorts of things like, well, this is bad because the Earth's magnetic field is dropping and that's why the sun looks different. Like, okay, maybe. But anytime we latch onto a physical reason, we're not going to the true root, which is consciousness. The Mandela effect is reminding us we can go to spirit, we can go to consciousness first, and that what we focus our attention and intention on Uh, independently, each of ourselves and collectively together, we can start to see some powerful, miraculous effects. And this can be a time of a golden age for all of us. And that's what I would like to see. So even in this time that looks like crisis and chaos, and I'm not denying that, I'm not saying it's not happening, because people could say like, well, wait a minute, what about this? Okay, sure. I'm, I'm not, I'm certainly not denying that. There's a lot of chaos but there's also this huge opportunity. I think they go together. I think it has to be this way. And so fortunately the toolkit has arrived right when we need it most. And it's, I think it's stunning when you start looking at these kind of Mandela effects that we've experienced and that have been happening for a long time. Carl Jung definitely seems to have experienced one himself. And that was, so now we've got a history of at least a hundred years of reports of this. It's not, it's not just a few years. It's not, necessarily just the Large Hadron Collider. So rather than focusing on material things, it looks to me like it's a calling to all of us to, you know, really move into this ascension, this um, evolution for humanity right now. I think we're witnessing it in action. I feel it's like a, it's almost like a a phoenix moment, having burned itself, rising from the ashes as a new experience as a new life. And I think some pe- some people need to go through the burning process. If people are wondering, but why? I don't want I don't want crash and burn. I don't want to go through yeah. this. But some of the people yeah. do need that and we are collected. We're a collective. We have we're social animals. We're all here together. And so for those who do need to have that, then they're getting that. But for those of us who know that there's something so much better and we we're good at bringing it for ourselves, we can now together join together and bring this for all of us. And so it's, it's an exciting time to be alive. And some people notice it's splitting. So, you know, like, like there could be two or more realities. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yes, definitely. And uh, just very quickly, when speaking about our history books changing, when I was reading this in in your book, I had this visual of a, of a scene from Harry Potter, one of the Harry Potter movies where uh, Harry Potter uh, had this book of magic, whatever that book was, and he opened the book and there was text in it on the page. And then the text disappeared and the new text appeared. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that could. I think that could actually happen. I think these things, these stories of magic, they're based in truth. And that's kind of exciting to be living in this time when it's showing itself much more prominently. 
And it's something that we can talk about and maybe not completely agree on. There's conversation about what's causing it. That's cool. I think those conversations are guiding us forward and helping us to keep asking questions. Yes. And speaking of which, Cynthia, I would love to have you back on Quantum Living. And I have a feeling that we'll be continuing this conversation. Thank you. Appreciate it so much. So this is, if you like, work in progress. (laughs) And once again, my big congratulations on the book. It is absolutely amazing. And I highly recommend this book to everyone. It is a pleasure to read and it's just mind opening and an experience in itself. So thank you so much. And thank you for this beautiful conversation. And I guess I will see you again. (laughs) Thank you so much, Anna. I, I just love talking with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.